What if I take one methylcyclohexene and just treat it with HBr by itself under non-radical conditions? Well, you've seen this reaction so many times that you're probably sick of it. I have this starting material. Electrons come out and form a bond with the hydrogen, kicking off the bromide. The hydrogen, of course, positions itself here because it gives me the more stable carbocation intermediate. And then the Br- minus comes in and forms a bond at that position, giving me this product here. You'll note that this carbon center is not a stereo center because it's not bonded to four different things. The branches up top and here to the left are identical all the way around. In fact, this molecule itself is meso because I can draw a line right down the middle of it and see that both the upper side of it and the lower side of it are mirror images of each other. What if I treat 1-methylcyclohexene with HBr under radical conditions? Well, as I pointed out before, if you do this reaction, it ends up putting the bromine at the anti-Markovnikov position in this double bond by a mechanism that I've already shown you. You're welcome to review it if you wish. Thus, this would give rise to this product. You'll note that this product has two stereocenters. Thus, I can potentially obtain two different sets of diastereomers, each having two enantiomers apiece. I will, in theory, get all four of those molecules in complete 50-50 mixtures. I now want to finish this lecture by just sharing with you a couple of examples in which radical reactions actually occur in real-life living systems. There's a whole family of enzymes that we humans, as well as many other eukaryotes have, that are called cytochrome enzymes. These enzymes are primarily responsible for helping our bodies metabolize nonpolar molecules. For instance, if you get a nonpolar molecule into your body somehow, such as an alkane like octane, which you would get if you breathed in gasoline fumes when you're filling up your car, how does your body get rid of that? The solvent that's present as a major constituent in our body is water, which is very polar. So if I get a nonpolar molecule in my body, how in the world is it going to be able to be excreted? It can't be excreted in urine or feces under traditional circumstances because it doesn't dissolve in polar media. The answer is these cytochrome enzymes convert nonpolar molecules into polar molecules by putting oxygens all over them. Here's how that reaction proceeds. The active site of the cytochrome enzymes is an iron 5 atom that is double bonded to an oxygen in its relaxed state. It undergoes a radical mechanism to convert to this product and form carbon radical. Carbon radical then abstracts this hydroxyl group radically to convert this active site to iron 3 and now this carbon has an OH on it. You'll notice that an OH is way more polar than a carbon-hydrogen bond. This is how cytochrome is able to take nonpolar molecules that don't dissolve in water in our bodies and convert them one step at a time into polar molecules that are water-soluble and can be excreted from our systems by once again radically placing OHs all over the molecule, as many as are needed, until that molecule becomes polar enough to dissolve in water and then be excreted through urine or feces. Here's a specific example, the conversion of nicotine, an infamous molecule with which I'm sure you're familiar, to a polar metabolite. Here's nicotine itself. You can see that its structure is not extremely polar. It does have an NH bond, which is slightly polar. But it's nonpolar enough that when it goes into my body, my body would have a difficult time dissolving it and allowing me to excrete it. So what occurs when nicotine is ingested or inhaled in some way is it encounters one of these cytochrome enzymes. Through a radical mechanism, the cytochrome enzyme abstracts a hydrogen at this position to form a carbon radical here, and then it radically donates an OH to this position to form a hydroxyl group here. At this point, this molecule can then be further oxidized by the cytochrome enzymes to form this molecule cottonine, which is water-soluble enough that it can be excreted in the urine. Now as mentioned, all of these cytochrome enzymes involve the element iron in their active sites. So yes, we do need to make sure that we consume iron. Here's a computer model of the heme cofactor, that is the iron active site inside the cytochrome enzymes. 
the iron atom is this gold atom in the center, which is flanked by four nitrogen atoms in this type of structure called a protoporphyrin. This is what the active site in the cytochrome enzymes looks like. As we saw in our earlier example, our iron 2 atom gets oxidized up to iron 5 oxide before it can act as a hydroxylating agent for polarizing nonpolar molecules that we've ingested or inhaled. Now, as I mentioned before, cytochrome enzymes primary responsibility is to hydroxylate and oxidize nonpolar substances that have invaded our systems to make them more polar so that they can be excreted through the urine or the feces. The beautiful thing about cytochrome enzymes is that they have the ability to do this to nearly any nonpolar molecule imaginable without any particular type of discrimination. One of my old biochemistry professors used to call the cytochrome enzymes the promiscuous enzymes. Let me show you one more example of cytochrome metabolism. So this is a molecule called seldane antihistamine. This would be the, a medicine that we would take as an antihistamine for controlling allergic reactions. So it turns out this molecule is cardiotoxic, that is harmful for our cardiovascular health, unless it's metabolized. Unfortunately, despite the fact it has these two hydroxy groups here, it is still as a whole nonpolar enough that it can't be excreted in the urine with relative ease. So how in the world does our body metabolize it? By using the cytochrome enzymes. So how in the world is this molecule metabolized for further use or excretion? Well, what occurs is one of the methyls on this tert butyl group out here gets oxidized through action of our cytochrome enzymes up to form a primary alcohol. Once this has been oxidized to a primary alcohol state, it then gets oxidized further to form an aldehyde and then a carboxylic acid, ultimately giving rise to this molecule known as Allegra. Now the specific site of oxidation of this molecule seldane antihistamine is more based on accessibility than radical stability. You might notice that there are numerous other positions that could generate a more stable radical en route to putting an OH on a position. However, apparently this molecule fits into the cytochrome enzyme's active site in such a way that the enzyme targets one of these terminal methyl groups rather than one of the more stable internal carbons. So that's going to be the place where we end today's lecture. I hope you've had an enjoyable time. Please stay tuned for my next and final lecture in which we'll finish our discussion on Chapter 12's coverage of radical chemistry by showing how it can be used in total synthesis. Until then, have an enjoyable rest of your day.